U2 are an Irish rock band from Dublin, formed in 1976. The group consists of both no lead vocals and rhythm guitar, the edge lead guitar, keyboards, and backing vocals, Adam Clay bass guitar and Larry Mullen Jr. drums and percussion. Initially rooted in post-punk, U2's musical style has evolved throughout their career, yet has maintained an anthemic quality built on both most expressive vocals and the edges chiming effects-based guitar sounds. Bonus lyrics, often embellished with spiritual imagery, focus on personal and socio-political themes. Popular for their live performances, the group have staged several ambitious and elaborate tours over their career. The band was formed when the members were teenage pupils of Mount Temple Comprehensive School and had limited musical proficiency. Within four years, they signed with Island Records and released their debut album, Boy 1980. Works such as their first UK number one album, War 1983 and singles Sunday Bloody Sunday and Pride in the Name of Love helped establish U2's reputation as a politically and socially conscious group. Their fourth album, The Unforgettable Fire 1984 was their first collaboration with producers Ryan Eno and Daniel Anoise, whose influence resulted in the band experimenting with a more abstract, ambient sound. By the mid-1980s, U2 had become renowned globally for their live act, highlighted by their performance at Live Aid in 1985. Their fifth album, The Joshua Tree 1987 made them international stars and was their greatest critical and commercial success. Topping music charts around the world, it produced their only number one singles in the U.S. to date, with or without you and I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Facing creative stagnation and a backlash to their documentary-slash-double album, Rattle and Hum 1988 U2 reinvented themselves in the 1990s. Beginning with their acclaimed seventh album, Take Tongue Baby 1991 and the multimedia intensive Zoo TV tour, the band pursued a new musical direction influenced by alternative rock, electronic dance music, and industrial music, and they embraced a more ironic, flippant image. This experimentation continued on their eighth album, Zoopod 1993 and concluded following their ninth album. Pop 1997 and the Pop Mart Tour, which were mixed successes. U2 regained critical and commercial favor with the records All That You Can't Leave Behind 2000 and How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb 2004 which established a more conventional, mainstream sound for the group. Although their 12th album, No Line on the Horizon 2009 did not meet commercial expectations, their U2 360 Degrees Tour of 2009 to 2011 set records for the highest attended and highest grossing concert tour, both of which stood until 2019. In the 2010s, U2 released the companion albums Songs of Innocence 2014 and Songs of Experience 2017, the former of which received criticism for its pervasive, no cost release through the iTunes Store. Their most recent album, Songs of Surrender 2023 consists of reimagined versions of 40 songs from their career. U2 have released 15 studio albums and are one of the world's best-selling music artists, having sold an estimated 150170 million records worldwide. One they have won 22 Grammy Awards, more than any other band, and in 2005, they were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in their first year of eligibility. Rolling Stone ranked U2 at number 22 on its list of the 100 greatest artists of all time. Throughout their career, as a band and as individuals, they have campaigned for human rights and social justice causes, working with organizations and coalitions that include Amnesty International, Julie 2000, Data Slash The One Campaign, Product Red, War Child, and Music Rising. History for a Chronological Guide, See Timeline of U2. Formation and early years 1976 to 1980 The band formed in 1976 while attending Mount Temple Comprehensive School pictured in 2007 in Dublin. In 1976, Larry Mullen Jr., then a 14-year-old pupil of Mount Temple Comprehensive School in Dublin, Ireland, posted a note on the school's notice board in search of musicians for a new band. At least five people responded and attended the first practice which was held on September 25th in Mullen's Kitchen. Mullen played drums and was joined by Paul Hewson both no on lead vocals, David Evans the Edge and his older brother Dick Evans on guitar, Adam Clayton, a friend of the Evans brothers, on bass guitar, and Ivan McCormick. Mullen later described it as the Larry Mullen band for about 10 minutes, 
Then Bono walked in and blew any chance I had of being in charge. Peter Martin, a friend of Mullen and McCormick, loaned his guitar and amplifier for the first practice three but he could not play and was quickly phased out for sources differ on whether he was in attendance at the first meeting or not. Five McCormick was dropped from the group after a few weeks. Six the remaining five members settled on the name feedback for the group because it was one of the few technical terms they knew. Early rehearsals took place in their music teacher's classroom at Mount Temple. Three most of their initial material consisted of cover songs, which they admitted was not their forte. Seven emerging punk rock acts such as The Stranglers, Eight The Jam, The Clash, Buzzy Cox, and Sex Pistols were strong influences on the group. The popularity of punk convinced them that musical proficiency was not a prerequisite to success. Nine We couldn't believe it. I was completely shocked. We weren't of an age to go out partying as such but I don't think anyone slept that night really, it was just a great affirmation to win that competition, even though I've no idea how good we were or what the competition was really like. But to win at that point was incredibly important for morale and everyone's belief in the whole project. The ATF on the bands winning the 1978 talent contest in Limerick 10 in April 1977, Feedback played their first gig for a paying audience at St. Finton's High School. Shortly thereafter, the band changed their name to the Hype.11 Dick Evans, who was older and by that time attending college, was becoming the odd man out. The rest of the band was leaning towards the idea of a fur piece ensemble. 10 in March 1978, the group changed their name to U2.12 Steve Haverhill, a punk rock musician with the Radiators and family friend of Clayton's had suggested six potential names from which a band chose you to four. It's ambiguity and open-ended interpretations, and because it was the name that they disliked the least. 13 that same month, U2, as a per piece, won a talent contest in Limerick sponsored by Harp Lager and the Evening Press. The prize consisted of £500 and a recording session for a demo that would be heard by record label CBS Ireland. 14 The win was an important milestone and affirmation for the fledgling act. 10 Within a few days, Dick Evans was officially phased out of the band with a farewell concert. At the Presbyterian Church Hall in Howth. 14 During the show, which featured the group playing cover songs as the hype, Dick ceremonially walked off stage. The remaining four band members returned later in the concert to play original material as U2.10 Dick joined another band, the Virgin Prudes, which comprised mutual friends of U2S. The Prudes were their default opening act early on, and the two groups often shared members for live performances to cover. For occasional absences.15 as part of their contest prize, U2 recorded their first demo tape at Keystone Studios in Dublin in April 1978-14 but the results were largely unsuccessful due to their inexperience.16 Irish magazine Hot Press was influential in shaping U2's future, in addition to being one of their earliest allies, the publication's journalist Bill Graham introduced the band to Paul McGuinness who agreed to be their manager in mid-1978.1417 with the connections he was making within the music industry, McGuinness booked demo sessions for the group and sought to garner them the record deal. The band continued to build their fan base with performances across Ireland 18 the most famous of which were a series of weekend afternoon shows at Dublin's Dandelion Market in the summer of 1979.1920 in August. U2 recorded demos at Windmill Lane Studios with CBS talent scout Chad D. Wagley as producer. Marking the first of the band's many recordings at the studio during their career. 21 The following month, three songs from the session were released by CBS as the Ireland only EP3. It was the group's first chart success, selling all 1,000 copies of its limited edition 12 inch vinyl almost immediately. 19 In December 1979, the band performed in London for their first shows outside Ireland, although they were unable to gain much attention from audiences or critics. 22 On February 26, 1980, their second single, Another Day, was released on the CBS label, but it then only for the Irish market. The same day, U2 played a show at the 2000 seat National Stadium in Dublin as part of an Irish tour. 23 24 Despite their gamble of booking a concert in such a large venue, the move paid off. 23 Bill Stewart, an A&R representative for Island Records, was in attendance and offered to sign them to the label. 25 The following month, the band signed a four-year, four-album contract with Island, 
which included a £50,000 advance and £50,000 in tour support. 26 Boy and October 1980-1982 Steve Lillywhite produced the band's first three studio albums, Boy, October, and War. In May 1980, U2 released 11 O'Clock TikTok their first international single and their debut on Island, but it failed to chart. 26 Martin Hammett, who produced the single, was slated to produce the band's debut album, Boy, but ultimately was replaced with Steve Lilly White. 27 from July to September 1980. U2 recorded the album at Windmill Lane Studios 2829, drawing from their nearly 40 song repertoire at the time. 30 Lilly White suggested recording Mullins drums in a stairwell and recording smashed bottles and forks played against a spinning bicycle wheel. 27 The band found Lilly White to be very encouraging and creative. Bono called him. Such a breath of fresh air while The Edge said he had a great way of pulling the best out of everybody. 27 The album's lead single, A Day Without Me was released in August. Although it did not chart 28 the song was the impetus for The Edge's purchase of a delay effect unit, the Electric Harmonics Memory Man, which came to define his guitar playing style and had a significant impact on the group's creative output. 26 Released in October 1980-31 Boy received generally positive reviews. 32 Paul Morley of NM he called it touching, precocious, full of archaic and modernist conviction. 33 While Declan Lynch of Hot Press said he found it almost impossible to react negatively to U2S music. 30 For Bono's lyrics reflected on adolescence innocence, and the passage into adulthood. 35 themes represented on the album cover through the photo of a young boy's face. 27 Boy peaked at number 52 in the United Kingdom and number 63 in the United States. 31 36 The album included the band's first songs to receive airplay on US radio, including the single I Will Follow 37 which reached number 20 on the top tracks. Rock chart. 38 Boy's release was followed by the Boy Tour. U2's first tour of continental Europe and the US.39 Despite being unpolished, these early live performances demonstrated the band's potential, as critics complimented their ambition and Bono's exuberance. 40 Bono and The Edge performing on the Boy Tour in May 1981 The band faced several challenges in writing their second album, October. On an otherwise successful American leg of the Boy Tour, Bono's briefcase containing in-progress lyrics and musical ideas was lost backstage during a March 1981 performance at a nightclub in Portland, Oregon. 41 42 The band had limited time to write new music on tour and in July began a two-month recording session. At Windmill Lane Studios largely unprepared 43 forcing Bono to quickly improvise lyrics. 41 Lily Waite, reprising his role as producer called the sessions completely chaotic and mad. 40 for October's lead single, Fire was released in July and was U2's first song to chart in the UK. 43-45 despite garnering the band an appearance on UK television program Top of the Pops, the single fell in the charts afterwards. 41 on August 16, 1981, the group opened Frith in Lizzie at the inaugural Slane concert. But The Edge called it one of the worst shows U2 ever played in their lives. 43 Adding to this period of self doubt, Bonos, The Edge's, and Mullen's involvement in the charismatic Christian group in Dublin called the Shalom Fellowship led them to question the relationship between their religious faith and the lifestyle of a rock band. 41 46 Bono and The Edge considered quitting U2 due to their perceived spiritual conflicts before deciding to. Leave Follow Instead. 41 47 U2 with radio host Dave Hanning Center in February 1982. October was released in October 1981 and contained overtly spiritual themes. 48 The album received mixed reviews and limited radio play. 49 And although it debuted at number 11 in the UK, 48 it sold poorly elsewhere. 50 The single Gloria was U2's first song to have its music video played on MTV generating excitement for the band during the October tour of 1981-1982 in markets where the television channel was available. 51 During the tour, U2 met Dutch photographer Anne Corbijn 52 who became their principal photographer and has had a major influence on their vision and public image. 53 In March 1982, the band played 14 dates as the opening act for the Jay Giles band, increasing their exposure. 54 Still U2 were disappointed by their lack of progress by the end of the October tour. Having run out of money and feeling unsupported by their record label, the group committed to improving, 
Clayton recalled that there was a firm resolve to come out of the box fighting with the next record. 50 War and Under a Blood Red Sky 1982-1983 After the October tour, you to decamped to a rented cottage in Houth, where they lived, wrote new songs, and rehearsed for their third album, War. Significant musical breakthroughs were achieved by The Edge in August 1982 during a two-week period of independent songwriter. While the other band members vacationed and Bono honeymooned with his wife, Charlie Da 5556 from September to November, the group recorded War at Windmill Lane Studios. Lily White, who had a policy of not working with an artist more than twice, was convinced by the group to return as their producer for a third time. 5758 The recording sessions featured contributions from violinist Steve Wickham and the female singers of Kid Creole and the Coconuts. 57 For the first time, Mullen agreed to play drums to a clip track to keep time. 55 After completing the album, U2 undertook a short tour of Western Europe in December. 59 Sunday Bloody Sunday 1983 0 minutes and 30 seconds Sunday Bloody Sunday features a martial drum beat, raw guitar, and lyrically, ugly emotionally charged response to violence. Problems playing this file. See media help. War's lead single, New Year's Day was released in January 1983. It reached number 10 in the UK and became the group's first hit outside of Europe. In the U.S., it received extensive radio coverage and peaked at number 53.60 Resolving their doubts of the October period 61 U2 released War in February.60 Critically, the album received favorable reviews, although a few UK reviewers were critical of it.62 Nonetheless, it was the band's first commercial success, debuting at number 1 in the U.K while reaching number 12 in the US.60 War's sincerity and rugged guitar were intentionally at odds with the trendier synth-pop of the time.63 described as a record on which the band turned pacifism itself into a crusade 64 war was lyrically more political than their first two records 65 focusing on the physical and emotional effects of warfare.57 the album included the protest song Sunday Bloody Sunday in which both no lyrically tried to contrast the events of the 1972 Bloody Sunday shooting with Easter Sunday.55 other songs from the record addressed topics such as nuclear proliferation seconds and the Polish solidarity movement New Year's Day.66 war was U2F's first record to feature Corbijn's photography.67 the album cover depicted the same young child who had appeared on the cover of their debut album albeit with his previously innocent expression replaced by a fearful one.62 playing on an outdoor stage the edge is on the left playing guitar Bono in the center with a microphone, and Adam Clayton on the right playing bass guitar. The drum set is partially visible on the right side. U2 performing at the U.S. Festival in May 1983 on the subsequent 1983 war tour of Europe, the U.S. and Japan 60 the band began to play progressively larger venues, moving from clubs to halls to arenas. 68 Bono attempted to engage the growing audiences with theatrical, often dangerous antics, climbing scaffoldings and Lighting rigs and jumping into the audience. 69 The sight of Bono waving the white flag during performances of Sunday Bloody Sunday became the tour's iconic image. 70 The band played several days at large European and American Music Festival 71, including a performance at the U.S. Festival on Memorial Day weekend for an audience of 125,000 people. 72 Nearly rained out. The group's June 5, 1983 concert at Red Rocks Amphitheater was singled out by Rolling Stone as one of 50 moments that changed the history of rock and roll. 73 The show was recorded for the concert video Live at Red Rocks, and what one of several concerts from the tour captured on their live album Under a Blood Red Sky. 74 The releases received extensive play on MTV and the radio expanding the band's audience and showcasing their prowess as a live act. 73 During the tour, the group established a new tradition by closing concerts. With the war track 40 during which The Edge and Clayton would switch instruments and the band members would leave the stage one by one as the crowd continued to sing the refrain How Long to Sing This Song? 7576 The war tour was U2F's first profitable tour, grossing about $2 million the Unforgettable Fire and Lit Aid 1984-1985 with their record deal with Island Records coming to an end. You signed the more lucrative extension in 1984. They negotiated the return of the copyrights of their songs, an increase in their royalty rate, and a general improvement in terms 
at the expense of a larger initial payment. 78 U2 feared the following the overt rock of the war album and tour. They were in danger of becoming another. Shrill sloganeering arena rock band. 79 They were confident the fans would embrace them as successors to groups like The Who and Led Zeppelin. But according to Bono, something just didn't feel right. We felt we had more dimension than just the next big anything. We had something unique to offer. 80 Thus, they sought experimentation for their fourth studio album, The Unforgettable Fire. 81 Clayton said, We were looking for something that was a bit more serious. More arty. 80 The Edge admired the ambient and weird works of Ryan Eno, who, along with his engineer Daniel Anoys, eventually agreed to produce the record. Their hiring contravened the initial recommendation of Island Records founder Chris Blackwell, who believed that just when the band were about to achieve the highest levels of success, Eno would bury them under a layer of avant garde nonsense. 82 The Unforgettable Fire 1984 0 minutes and 31 seconds The Unforgettable Fire has a rich, Symphonic sound built from ambient instrumentation, a driving rhythm, and a lyrical sketch. 83 partly recorded in Slane Castle. The Unforgettable Fire was released in October 1984 and was at the time the band's most marked change in direction. 84 It was ambient and abstract, and featured a rich, orchestrated sound. Under La Noise direction, Mullins' drumming became looser, funkier, and more subtle and Clayton's bass became more subliminal. 85 complementing the album's atmospheric sound, the lyrics were left open to interpretation, providing what the band called a very visual feel. 84 due to a tight recording schedule, Bono felt songs like Bad and Pride in the Name of Love were incomplete sketches. 82 the album reached number 1 in the UK 86 and was successful in the US. 87 the lead single Pride in the Name of Love written about civil rights movement leader Martin Luther King Jr. was the band's biggest hit to that point and was their first song to chart in the US Top 40. 88 U2 performing in Sydney in September 1984 on the Unforgettable Fire Tour Much of the Unforgettable Fire Tour moved into indoor arenas as U2 began to win their long battle to build their audience. 89 The complex textures of the new studio recorded tracks, such as the Unforgettable Fire and Bad posed a challenge in translating to live performances. 84 One solution was programming music sequencers which the band had previously been reluctant to use but now incorporate into the majority of their performances. 84 songs on the album had been criticized as being unfinished fuzzy and unfocused but were better received by critics when played on stage. Rolling Stone, which was critical of the album version of Bad described its live performance as a showstopper. 90 in March 1985. The Rolling Stone cover story called you to the band of the 80s saying that for a growing number of rock and roll fans you two have become the band that matters. Most, maybe even the only band that matters. 78 On July 13, 1985, the group performed at the Lid Aid concert at Wembley Stadium for Ethiopian Famine Relief 91 before a crowd of 72,000 fans and a worldwide television audience of 1.5 billion people. 90 93 During a 12 minute performance of Bad Boat, No Climbs Down. From the stage to embrace and dance with a female fan he had picked out of the crowd 90 to showing a television audience the personal connection that he could make with fans. 94 The performance was regarded as a pivotal event in the band's career. 95 The Guardian cited Liv Haid as the moment that made stars of U2, and it included their performance on a list of 50 key events in rock history. 96 The Joshua Tree and Rattle and Hum 1986 to 1990 The Wild Beauty cultural richness, spiritual vacancy and ferocious violence of America are explored to compelling effect in virtually every aspect of the Joshua Tree in the title and the cover art, the blues and country or wings evident in the music indeed. Bono says that dismantling the mythology of America is an important part of the Joshua Tree's artistic objective. The N.E.H.O.M.Y.D. Curtis 97 for their fifth album, The Joshua Tree. The band wanted to build on the unforgettable fire's textures, but instead of out-of-focus experimentation, they sought the harder-hitting sound within the limitation of conventional song structures. 98 Realizing that U2 had no tradition and that their knowledge of music from before their childhood was limited, the group delved into American and Irish roots music. 99 Friendships with Bob Dylan, Van Morrison, and Keith Richards motivated Bono to explore blues, folk, 
and gospel music and to focus on his skills as a songwriter and lyricist. 100 U2 halted the album sessions in June 1986 to serve as a headline act on the Conspiracy of Hope benefit concert tour for Amnesty International. Rather than distract the band, the tour invigorated their new material. 101 the following month. Bono traveled to Nicaragua and El Salvador and saw firsthand the distress of peasants affected by political conflicts and U.S. military intervention. The experience became a central influence on their new music. 100 to the tree pictured on the Joshua Tree album sleeve. Adam Clayton said, The desert was immensely inspirational to us as a mental image for this record. 103 The Joshua Tree was released in March 1987. The album just opposes antipathy towards U.S. foreign policy against the group's deep fascination with the country, its open spaces, freedom, and ideals. 104 The band wanted music with a sense of location and a cinematic quality, and the record's music and lyrics draw on imagery created by American writers whose works. The band had been reading. 105 The Joshua Tree was critically acclaimed. Robert Hilburn of the Los Angeles Times said the album confirms on record what this band has been slowly asserting for three years now on stage. U2 is what the Rolling Stones ceased being years ago the greatest rock and roll band in the world. 106 The record went to number one in over 20 countries 107 including the UK where it received a platinum certification in 48 hours and sold 235,000 copies in its first week making it the fastest seller in British chart history at the time. 108 109 in the US. It spent nine consecutive weeks at number one. 110 the album included the hit singles with or without you I still haven't found what I'm looking for and where the streets have no name the first two of which became the group's only number one hits in the US. U2 became the fourth rock band to be featured on the cover of Time magazine 111 which called them rock's hottest ticket. 112 The album and its songs received four Grammy Award nominations, win for Album of the Year and Best Rock Performance by a duo or group with vocal. 113 Many publications, including Rolling Stone, have cited The Joshua Tree as one of rock's greatest albums. 114 The Joshua Tree Tour was the first tour on which the band played shows in stadiums alongside smaller arena shows. 115 It grossed $40 million and drew 3 million attendees. 102 In October 1988, the group released Rattle and Hum, the double album and theatrically released documentary film that captured the band's experiences with American roots music on the Joshua Tree Tour. The record featured nine studio tracks and six live viewed performances, including recordings at Sun Studio in Memphis and collaborations with Dylan and B.B. King. Intended as a tribute to American Music 117 The project received mixed reviews from both film and music critics. One Rolling Stone editor spoke of the album's excitement another described it as misguided and bombastic. 118 The film's director, Phil Bonu described it as an overly pretentious look at U2.119 the film underperformed at the box office and was pulled from theaters after three weeks 120 having grossed only 8.6 million dollars despite the criticism the album sold 14 million copies and reached number one worldwide. 122 lead single desire became the band's first number one song in the UK while reaching number three in the Thus.123 Most of the album's new material was played on 1989-1990s La Town Tour, which only visited Australasia, Japan, and Europe. In addition, they had grown dissatisfied with their live performances, Mullen recalled, We were the biggest, but we weren't the best.124 With a sense of musical stagnation. Bono hinted at changes to come during a December 30, 1989 concert near the end of the tour. Before a hometown crowd in Dublin, he said on stage that it was the end of something for you two and that they had to go away and just dream it all up again. 125 126 Hey Tongue Baby, Zoo TV, and Zorpa 1990 1993 Buzzwords on this record were trashy, throwaway, dark, sexy, and industrial, all good and earnest, polite, sweet, righteous, raucous, and linear, all bad. It was good if a song took you on a journey or made you think your hi-fi was broken, bad if it reminded you of recording studio for you to be R.I.A. and you know, on the recording of a tongue baby 127 stung by the criticism of rattle and hum, the band sought to 
transformed themselves musically. 128 Seeking inspiration from German reunification, they began work on their seventh studio album, Take Tongue Baby, Batterlin's Hansa Studios in October 1990 with producers Daniel Anoys and Brian Eno. 129 The sessions were fraught with conflict, as the band argued over their musical direction and the quality of their material. While Clayton and Mullen preferred a sound similar to U2's previous work, Bono and The Edge were inspired by European industrial music and electronic dance music and advocated to change. Weeks of tension and slow progress nearly prompted the group to break up until they made a breakthrough with the improvised writing of the song 1.130 They returned to Dublin in 1991, where morale improved and the majority of the album was completed. The Flight 1991 0 minutes and 28 seconds The Flight features hip-hop beats, distorted vocals, and a hard industrial edge that differed from U2's typical sound. 131 A Tongue Baby was released in November 1991. The album represented a calculated change in musical and thematic direction for the group. The shift was one of their most dramatic since the unforgettable fire. 132 Sonically, the record incorporated influences from alternative rock, dance, and industrial music of the time, and both no referred to its musical departure as for men chopping down the Joshua Tree. 133 thematically, it was a more introspective and personal record, it was darker, yet at times more flippant than the band's previous work. Commercially and critically, it has been one of the band's most successful albums. It produced five hit singles, including The Flight Mysterious Ways and One and it was a crucial part of the band's early 1990s reinvention. 134 in 1993, Take Tongue Baby won a Grammy Award for Best Rock Performance by a duo or group with vocal. 135 Like the Joshua Tree, many publications have cited the record as one of rock's greatest. 114 Bono with black hair, black sunglasses, and a black leather attire speaking into a microphone. Bono in March 1992 on the Zoo TV tour portraying his persona the fly a leather-clad egomaniac meant to parody rock stardom. Like a tongue baby, the 1992-1993 Zoo TV tour was an unequivocal break with the band's past. In contrast to the austere stage setups of previous U tours, Zoo TV was an elaborate multimedia event. It satirized the pervasive nature of television and its blurring of news, entertainment, and home shopping by attempting to instill sensory overload in its audience. 133 136 137 The stage featured large video screens that showed visual effects, random video clips from pop culture, and flashing text phrases, along with a lighting system partially made of Tridban automobiles. 138 Whereas you two were known for their earnest performances in the 1980s. The group's Zoo TV performances were intentionally ironic and self-deprecating. 133 On stage, Bono performed as several over-the-top characters, including the leather-clad egomaniac The Fly 139, the greedy televangelist Mirrorball Man and the devilish Nassifist 2. 140. Prank phone calls were made to U.S. President George H.W. Bush, the United Nations, and others. Live satellite link UPS to war torn for Yevo caused controversy. 141 Zoo TV was the highest grossing North American tour of 1992, earning $67 million in June 1993. You'd signed a long term, six album deal to remain with Island Records Flash Polygram. 143 The Los Angeles Times estimated that the deal was worth $60 million to the band 140 for making. Them the highest pay rock group ever. 145 The following month, the group released a new album, Zor Pop. Quickly recorded during a break in the Zoo TV tour in early 1993, it expanded on many of the themes from Eight Tongue Baby and the tour. Initially intended to be an EP, Zor Pop ultimately evolved into a full length LP album. It was an even greater musical departure for the group, delving further into electronic, industrial, and dance music. 146 country musician Johnny Cash sang the lead vocals on the closing track The Wanderer. Most of the songs were played at least once during the 1993 legs of the tour, which visited Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan. Half the album's tracks became permanent fixtures in the set list. 147 Although the commercially successful Zor Pot won the Grammy Award for Best Alternative Music Album in 1994. The band regarded it with mixed feelings, as they felt it was more of an interlude. 
Clayton's issues with alcohol came to a head on the final leg of the Zoo TV tour. After experiencing the blackout, Clayton was unable to perform for the group's November 26, 1993 show in Sydney 148 which served as the dress rehearsal for a worldwide television broadcast the following night. Bass guitar technician Stuart Morgan filled in for him, marking the first time a member of U2 had missed a concert since their earliest days. 149 after the incident, Clayton resolved to quit drinking alcohol. 148 the tour concluded the following month in Japan. Overall, it tallied 5.3 million in ticket sales 150 and 151 million dollars in gross revenues. 151 Q's Tom Boyle said in 2002 that Zoo TV was the most spectacular rock tour staged by any band. 152 Passengers, Pop, and Pop Mart 1994 to 1998 in 1995, following a long break, U2 contributed Hold Me, Thrill Me, Kiss Me. Killed Me to the soundtrack album of the film Batman Forever. 153 The song was a hit, reaching number one in Australia and Ireland, number two in the UK, and number 16 in the US. 154 In November, the band released an experimental album called Original Soundtracks 1, a collaboration with Brian Eno, who contributed as a full songwriter partner and performer. Due to his participation and the record's highly experimental nature, the band chose to release it under the moniker Passengers to distinguish it from U2's conventional albums. 155 Marlin said of the release, There's a thin line between interesting music and self indulgence. We crossed it on the Passengers record. 156 It was commercially unnoticed by U2 standards and it received generally mixed reviews. 157 The single Miss For Yevo featuring Luciano Pavarotti was among Bono's favorite U2 songs. 158 U2 began work on their next studio album, Pop, in mid 1995, holding recording sessions with Nelly Hooper. Flood and how we the band mixed the contrasting influences of each producer into their music, in particular how Howie's experiences with electronica and dance music. 159 Mullen was sidelined due to back surgery in November 160, prompting the other band members to take different approaches to songwriter, such as programming drum loops and playing to samples provided by Howie B. 159 upon Mullen's return in February 1996. The group began reworking much of their material but struggled to complete songs, causing them to miss their mid-year deadline to complete the record. 161 Further complicating matters, the band allowed manager Paul McGuinness to book their 1997-1998 Pop Mar tour with the album still in progress 162 Bono called it the worst decision U2 ever made. 163 Rush to complete the album. The band delayed its release date a second time from the 1996 holiday season to March 1997 161 164 cutting into tour rehearsal time. 24 165 even with the additional recording time, U2 worked up to the last minute to complete songs. 159 162 The Pop Mar Tour stage featured a golden arch, mirror ball lemon, and 150 foot long lead screen. The band emerged from the lemon during on course, although it occasionally malfunctioned. In February 1997-166, the group released Pop's lead single, Discotheca Dance Heavy Song with a music video in which the band wore village people costumes. 167 The song reached number one in the UK, Japan, and Canada, but did not chart for long in the US despite debuting at number 10.166. Within days of the single's release, the group announced the Pop Mart tour with a press conference in the lingerie section of a Kmart department store. 166 tickets went on sale shortly after, but Pop would not be released until March. 168 The album represented you to s further exploration of nightclub culture, featuring heavy funky dance rhythms. 169 The record drew favorable reviews. 170 Rolling Stone stated that U2 had defied the odds and made some of the greatest music of their lives. 171 Other critics, though, felt that the album was a major disappointment. 172 Despite debuting at number one in over 30 countries, pop dropped off.
the charts quickly. 166 Bono admitted that the album didn't communicate the way it was intended to 163 while The Edge called it a compromise project by the end. 162 The Pop Mart Tour commenced in April 1997 and was intended as a satire of consumerism. 168 The stage included a 100 foot tall 30 meter golden yellow arch reminiscent of the McDonald's logo, a 40 foot tall 12 meter mirror ball lemon and a 150-foot-long 46-meter LED video screen. At the time the world's largest dot 173U2S Big Chick failed to satisfy many who were seemingly confused by the band's new kit image and the tour's elaborate set. 174 The reduced rehearsal time for the tour affected the quality of early shows 175 and in some U.S. markets. The band played to half empty stadiums. 176 177 on several occasions. The mirror ball lemon from which the band emerged for the encores malfunctioned, trapping them inside. 178 Despite the mixed reviews and difficulties of the tour, both know considered Pop Mart to be better than Zoo TV aesthetically, and as an art project, it is a clearer thought. 179 He later explained, when that show worked. It was mind-blowing. 180 European leg of the tour featured two highlights. The group's September 20, 1997 show in Reggio Henry was attended by over 150,000 people, which was reported to have set a world record for the largest paying audience for a one-act show. 181-182 U2 also performed in Sarajevo on September 23, making them the first major group to stage a concert there. Following the Bosnian War, 183 Mullen described the show as an experience I will never forget for the rest of my life. And if I had to spend 20 years in the band just to play that show, and have done that, I think it would have been worthwhile. 180 for Bono called the show one of the toughest and one of the sweetest nights of my life. 185 The tour concluded in March 1998 with gross revenues of $173.6 million and 3.98 million tickets sold. 186 The following month, U2 appeared on the 200th episode of the animated sitcom The Simpsons, in which Homer Simpson disrupts the band on stage during a Pop Mart concert. 187 In November 1998, U2 released their first compilation album, The Best of 1981-1991-188 which featured a re-recording of a 1987 beside, Sweetest Thing has its single. 189 The album broke the first week sales record in the US for a greatest hits collection by the group 190 while Sweetest Thing topped the singles charts in Ireland and Canada. 188 All That You Can't Leave Behind and Elevation Tour 1998 to 2002 Following the mixed success of their musical pursuits in the 1990s, you'd sought to simplify their sound, The Edge said that with pop, the group had taken the deconstruction of a rock and roll band format to its absolute nth degree. 191 For their tenth album, All That You Can't Leave Behind. The group wanted to return to their old recording ethos of the band in a room playing together. 191 Reuniting with Eno and La Noise, U2 began working on the album in late 1998.191-192 After their experiences with being pressured to complete pop, the band were content to work without deadlines. 191 With Bono's schedule limited by his commitments to debt relief for Julie 2000 and the other band members spending time with their families. The recording sessions stretched through August 2000.191-193 released in October of that year. All That You Can't Leave Behind was seen by critics as a back to basics album 194 on which the group returned to a more mainstream, conventional rock sound. 191-195 For many of those not won over by the band's forays into dance music. It was considered a return to grace 196-197 Rolling Stone called it U2's third masterpiece alongside the Joshua Tree and a Tongue Baby. 198 The album debuted at number 1 in 32 countries 199 and sold 12 million copies. 200 Its lead single, Beautiful Day was a worldwide hit, reaching number 1 in Ireland, the UK, Australia, and Canada. While peaking at number 21 in the US.201 the song won Grammy Awards for Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocal, Song of the Year, and Record of the Year.202 At the awards ceremony, Bono declared that U2 were reapplying for the 
Job of the Best Band in the World. 203 The album's other singles were worldwide hits as well. Stuck in a moment you can't get out of elevation and walk on reached number one in Canada 204 while charting in the top five in the UK and top ten in Australia. 45 205 After the elaborate stadium productions of their previous two tours, U2's 2001 elevation tour was of scale down affair that featured a heart-shaped stage. The band's 2001 elevation tour commenced in March, visiting North America and Europe across three legs. 206 for the tour. U2 performed on a scale downstage, returning to arenas after nearly a decade of stadium productions. 197 Mirroring the album's themes of emotional contact, connection, and communication, the tour set was designed to afford the group greater proximity to their fans. 207 The heart shaped catwalk around the stage encircled many audience members. 208 And festival seating was offered in the U.S. for the first time in the group's history. 209 During the tour, U2 headlined a pair of Flame concerts in Ireland, playing to crowds of 80.000.210.211 Following the September 11th attacks in the U.S., all that you can't leave behind found added resonance with American audiences 212 as the album climbed in the charts and songs such as Walk on and Peace on Earth garnered radio airplane.213 in October, U2 performed at Madison Square Garden in New York City for the first time since the attacks. Bono and The Edge said these shows were among their most memorable and emotional performances. 212 214 The Elevation Tour was the top earning North American tour of 2001 with a gross of $109.7 million, the second most ever at the time for a North American tour. 215 Globally, it grossed $143.5 million from $2.18 million. Tickets sold 186 making it the year's highest grossing tour overall. 216 Spin named U2 the band of the year for 2001, saying they had schooled bands half their age about what a rock show could really accomplish. 197 On February 3, 2002, U2 performed during the Super Bowl XXXVI halftime show. In a tribute to those who died in the September 11th attacks, the victims' names were projected onto a backdrop, and at the end, Bono opened his jacket to reveal an American flag in the Lightning Dog 217 Sports Illustrated, Rolling Stone, and USA Today ranked the band's performance as the best halftime show in Super Bowl history. 218 Later that month, U2 received four additional Grammy Awards, All That You Can't Leave Behind One Best Rock Album, while Walk On was named Record of the Year, marking the first time an artist had won the latter award in consecutive years for songs from the same album got 219 in November 2002. The band released their second compilation, The Best of 1990 to 2000, which featured several remixed 1990s songs and two new tracks, including the single Electrical Storm. 220 How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb and Vertigo Tour 2003 to 2006 looking for a harder hitting rock sound than that of all That You Can't Leave Behind 221 U2 began recording their 11th studio album how to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb, in February 2003 with producer Chris Thomas. 222 After nine months of work, the band had an album's worth of material ready for release, but they were not satisfied with the results. Mullen said that the songs had no magic. 221 The group subsequently enlisted Steve Lillywhite to take over as producer in Dublin in January 2004. 223 Lillywhite, along with his assistant Jack Knife Lee spent six months with the band reworking songs and encouraging better performances. 221 Several other producers received credits on the album, including La Noise, He No, Flood, Carl Glanville, and Nelly Who. For 224 Bono acknowledged that the involvement of multiple producers affected the record's sonic cohesion. 225 Vertigo 2004 0 minutes and 31 seconds Vertigo which The Edge described as visceral rock and roll 221 became a hit worldwide and was used in a cross promotion with Apple. Released in November 2004. How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb received favorable reviews from critics. 226 The album featured lyrics touching own life, death, love, war, faith, and family. 227 It reached number one in 30 countries. 226 Including the U.S., where first week sales of 840,000 copies nearly doubled those of all that you can't leave behind.
setting a personal best for the band. 228 overall, it sold 9 million copies globally. 229 for the album's release. U2 partnered with Apple for several cross promotions. The first single, Vertigo, was featured in a television advertisement for the company's IPO music player, while a U2 branded IPO and Digital box set exclusive to the iTunes store were released. 230 Vertigo was an international hit, topping the charts in Ireland and the UK. 231 while reaching number 2 in Canada and number 5 in Australia. 232 The song won three Grammy Awards, including one for Best Rock Song. 233 Other singles from the album were also hits. Sometimes you can't make it on your own, written as a tribute to Bono's late father went to number one in the UK and Canada, while City of Blinding Lights reached number two in both regions. 234 in March 2005, U2 were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame by Bruce Springsteen in their first year of eligibility. 235-236 During his speech, Springsteen said the band had beaten the odds by continuing to do their finest work and remaining at the top of their game and the charts for 25 years. 237 The outdoor stage of the Vertigo Tour, pictured in June 2005, featured a massive LED screen. U2's 2005 to 2006 Vertigo Tour was preceded by several complications. The sudden illness afflicting the Edge's daughter nearly resulted in the tour's cancellation. Before the group decided to adjust the tour schedule to accommodate her treatment. 238 Additionally, ticket pre-sales on the band's website were plagued with issues. As subscribing members encountered technical glitches and limited ticket availability, partially due to scalpers exploiting the system. 239 Commencing in March 2005 237, the Vertigo Tour consisted of arena shows in North America and stadium shows internationally across five legs. 240 The indoor stage replaced the heart shaped ramp of the Elevation Tour with an elliptical one and featured retractable video curtains around the stage. 241 While the stadium stage used a massive LED video screen. 242 set lists on tour varied more than in the group's past and included songs they had not played in decades. 243 like its predecessor, the Vertigo tour was a commercial success, ranking as the top earning tour of 2005 with $260 million grossed. 244 U2 performing at Madison Square Garden on October 21, 2005 in February 2006. U2 received five additional Grammy Awards, including Song of the Year for Sometimes You Can't Make It on Your Own and Best Rock Album and Album of the Year for How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb 245 The awards made the album and its singles winners in all eight categories in which U2 were nominated, spanning to separate Grammy ceremonies. 246 The group resumed the Vertigo tour that month with a leg in American Leg 245 on which several shows were filmed for the concert film U to 3D.247 It was released in theaters nearly two years later 248 and was the world's first live-action digital 3D film. 247 In March, the band postponed the tour's remaining shows until the end of the year due to the health of the Edge's daughter. 245 On September 25, 2006, U2 and Green Day performed at the Louisiana Superdome prior to an NFL football game, the New Orleans Saints' first home game in the city since Hurricane Katrina. The two bands covered the skids song The Saints Are Coming during the performance and for a benefit single 249 which reached number one in Australia and throughout Europe. 250 U2 issued an official autobiography, U2 by U2, that month 249 followed in November by their third compilation album, U218 singles. 251 The Vertigo Tour concluded in December having sold 4.6 million tickets and having earned $389 million, the second highest gross ever at the time. 242 In August 2006, the band incorporated its publishing business in the Netherlands following the capping of Irish artists' tax exemption at Euros 250.000.252 The Edge stated that businesses often seek to minimize their tax burdens. 253 The move was criticized in the Irish Parliament. 253 254 The band defended themselves, saying approximately 95% of their business took place outside Ireland, that they were taxed globally because of this, and that they were all personal investors and employers in the country. 255 Bono later said.
I think you to s tax business is our own business and I think it is not just to the letter of the law but to the spirit of the law. 256 no line on the horizon and you to 360 degrees tour 2006 to 2011 recording for you to s 12 album no line on the horizon began with producer Rick Riven in 2006 but the sessions were short lived and the material was shelved. 257 in May 2007. The group began new sessions with Brian Eno and Daniel Anoise in Fis, Morocco, involving the producers as full songwriter partners. 258 intending to write future hymns songs that would be played forever. The group spent two weeks recording in a riot and exploring local music. 259 260 The Edge called it a very freeing experience that reminded him in many ways of early on and why they got into a band in the first place. Just that joy of playing Daw 261 as recording on the album continued in New York, London, and Dublin, the band scaled back their experimental pursuits, which Eno said sounded kind of synthetic and were not easily married with the group's sound. Daw 262 No Line on the Horizon was released in February 2009. More than four years after How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb marking the longest gap between albums of the band's career to that point. 263 it received generally positive reviews, including their first five-star Rolling Stone review, but critics found it was not as experimental as originally billed. 264 the album debuted at number one in over 30 countries 265 but its sales of 5 million were seen as a disappointment by youth standards and it did not contain the hit single. 266 267 following the album's release the band discussed tentative plans for a follow-up record entitled songs of ascent. 268 bono described the project as a more meditative album on the theme of pilgrimage. 259 the concert stage Four large legs curve up above the stage and hold a video screen which is extended down to the band. The legs are lit up in green. The video screen has multicolored lights flashing on it. The audience surrounds the stage on all sides. At 164 feet tall, the stage structure from the U to 360 degrees tour was the largest ever constructed. The tour became the highest grossing in history, having earned $736 million. The group embarked on the U to 360 Degrees tour in June 2009. It was their first live venture for Live Nation under a 12-year, $100 million, 50 million pounds contract signed the year prior. 269 270 As part of the deal, the company assumed control over U to S Turing, merchandising, and official website. 271 The 360 Degrees tour concerts featured the band playing stadiums in the round on A circular stage, allowing the audience to surround them on all sides. 272 To accommodate the stage configuration, a large four-legged structure nicknamed the claw was built above the stage, with the sound system and a cylindrical, expanding video screen on top of it. At 164 feet 50 meters tall, it was the largest stage ever constructed. 273 The tour visited Europe and North America in 2009. On October 25, 2009, You'd set a new U.S. record for single concert attendance for one headline act, performing to 97,014 people at the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. 274 in May 2010, while rehearsing for the next leg of the tour, Bono suffered a herniated disc and severe compression of the sciatic nerve, requiring emergency back surgery. 275 The band were forced to postpone the North American leg of the tour and headlining performance at the Glastonbury Festival 2010 until the following year. 276 After Bono's recovery, U2 resumed the 360 degrees tour in August 2010 with legs in Europe, Australia, and New Zealand, during which they began to play new, unreleased songs live. 277 By its conclusion in July 2011, U360 Degrees had set records for the highest grossing concert tour $736 million and most tickets sold for a tour $7.3 million 278 songs of Innocence and Innocence Plus Experience Tour 2011-2015 to U2 Performing at the Apple Product launch at which Songs of Innocence was announced in September 2014 Throughout the 360 Degrees Tour, the band worked on multiple projects, including a traditional rock album produced by Danger Mouse, the dance record produced by Redun and Will.I.Am, and Songs of Ascent.279 However, the latter was not completed to their satisfaction, 
and by December 2011, Clayton admitted it would not come to fruition. 280 sessions with Danger Mouse instead formed the foundation of U2's next album, and they worked with him until May 2013 before enlisting the help of producers Paul Edward, Ryan Tedder, Dick Langaffney, and Flood. The band suspended work on the album late in 2013 to contribute a new song, Ordinary Love to the film Mandela, Long Walk to Freedom. 281 282 The track, written in honor of Nelson Mandela, won the 2014 Golden Globe Award for Best Original Song. 281 283 In November 2013, U2's longtime manager Paul McGuinness stepped down from his post as part of a deal with Lid Nation to acquire his management firm, Principal Management. McGuinness, who had managed the group for over 30 years, was succeeded by Guy Osiri. 284 in February 2014, another new huge song, the single Invisible debuted in a Super Bowl television advertisement and was made available in the iTunes store at no cost to launch a partnership with Product Red. And Bank of America 258.285-286 Bono called the track a sneak preview of their pending record. 287 on September 9, 2014. U2 appeared at an Apple product launch event to make a surprise announcement of their 13th studio album, Songs of Innocence. They released it digitally the same day to all iTunes store customers at no cost 288 making it available to over 500 million people in what Apple CEO Tim Cook called the largest album release of all time. 289 Apple reportedly paid Universal Music Group and U2 a lump sum for eight five-week exclusivity period in which he distribute the album 290 and spent 100 million dollars on a promotional campaign. 289 Songs of Innocence recalls the group members' youth in Ireland, touching on childhood experiences, loves and losses, while paying tribute to their musical inspirations. 291 Bono described it as the most personal album we've written. 292 The record received mixed reviews and drew criticism for its digital release strategy. It was automatically added to users' iTunes accounts, which for many, triggered an unprompted download to their electronic devices. 293 294 295 Chris Richards of the Washington Post called the release rock and roll as dystopian junk mail. 296 The group's press tour for the album was interrupted after Gorno was seriously injured in a bicycle accident in Central Park on November 16, 2014. He suffered fractures of his shoulder blade. Humorous, Orbit, and Pinky Finger 297 leading to uncertainty that he would ever be able to play guitar again. 298 U2 performing in Paris on December 7, 2015, the final date of the Innocence Plus Experience Tour. It was filmed for an HBO broadcast concert video. Following the bonus recuperation, U2 embarked on the Innocence Plus Experience Tour in May 2015 299 visiting arenas in North America and Europe from May through December. 300 The group structured their concerts around a loose autobiographical narrative of innocence passing into experience with a fixed set of songs for the first half of each show and a varying second half, separated by an intermission A first for U2 concerts. 301 The stage span the length of the very floor and comprised three sections the rectangular main stage, the smaller circular B stage, and a connecting walkway. 301 The centerpiece of the set was a 96-foot long 29M double-sided video screen that featured an interior catwalk, allowing the band members to perform amidst the video projections. 300 to 303 U2S sound system was moved to the venue ceilings and arranged in an oval array in hopes of improving acoustics by evenly distributing sound throughout the arena. 301 in total the tour grossed $152.2 million from 1.29 million tickets sold. 304 The final date of the tour, one of two Paris shows rescheduled due to the November 13, 2015 attacks in the city, was filmed for the Video Innocence Plus Experience, live in Paris and broadcast on the American television network HBO. 300 by 306 The Joshua Tree Anniversary Tours and Songs of Experience 2016 to 2019 in 2016 U2 worked on their next studio album, Songs of Experience, which was intended to be a companion piece to Songs of Innocence. 307 The group had mostly completed the album by year's end and planned to release it in the fourth quarter, but after the shift of global politics in a conservative direction, 
highlighted by the UK's Brexit referendum and the 2016 US presidential election. They chose to put the record on hold and reassess its tone. 308 The group spent the extra time rewriting lyrics, rearranging and remixing songs, and pursuing different production styles. 307 309 Further impacting the lyrical direction of the album was a brush with mortality that Bo No experienced. 309 310 In December 2016, he underwent open heart surgery due to an aortic aneurysm that forms over time as a result of having a bicuspid aortic valve. 311 312 The Joshua Tree Tour 2017 commemorated the 30th anniversary of the eponymous record. It was the highest grossing tour of the year, earning $316 million. U2 toured in 2017 to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Joshua Tree. With each show featuring a performance of the entire album. 313 It was the first time the group toured in promotion of an album from their back catalog, rather than a new release. 314 The Edge cited the same world events that caused the group to delay songs with experience for what he judged to be renewed resonance of the Joshua Tree's subject matter and a reason to revisit it. 313 The tour stage featured a 7.6K video screen measuring 200 feet 45 feet 61 meters 14 meters 315. That was, according to The Guardian, the largest and highest resolution screen used on a concert tour. 316 The tour included a headlining appearance at the Bonnaroo Music Festival in June. 317 The tour grossed more than $316 million from over 2.7 million tickets sold. 318 Making it the highest grossing tour of the year. 319 Songs with Experience was released on December 1, 2017. 320 Lyrically the album reflects the political and personal apocalypse that Bo No felt had occurred in his life in 2016. 321 The first single, You're the Best Thing About Me 322 is one of several songs from the record for which Bo No wrote the lyrics. As letters were addressed to people and places closest to his heart. 309 310 songs with experience received generally mixed reviews from critics. 323 Bo It was the sixth best selling album globally in 2017, with 1 1.3 million copies sold. 324 In 2018, the group embarked on the Experience Plus Innocence Tour, beginning in Tulsa, Oklahoma. May 2, 2018.325 It grossed $126.2 million from 924,000 tickets sold, according to Billboard.326 U2H Joshua Tree Anniversary Concert Tour visited Oceania and Asia in 2019, marking the band's first performances in Australia and New Zealand since the 360 Degrees Tour in 2010-327 and their first ever performances in South Korea, Singapore, India and the Philippines. 328 The band released a new single, A Hymn Fit with Indian Musician They Are Raman to promote their December concert in India. 329 The group's 2019 shows grossed $73.8 million and sold 567,000 tickets, bringing the cumulative total for their Joshua Tree anniversary tours to $390.8 million grossed and 3.3 million tickets sold. 330 Songs of Surrender and Concerts at Sphere at the Venetian Resort 2020 Current in October 2022, several media outlets reported that U2 were in discussions to sign with Irving Azoff and his son Jeffrey a full stop management, following the end of I.O. series 9-year tenure as the band's manager. 331 In January 2023, U2 announced the album Songs of Surrender, which comprises 40 re-recorded and reinterpreted songs from the group's back catalogue. It was released on March 17, 2023. 332 During a Super Bowl LBII television advertisement, it was announced that U2 would perform a limited concert engagement to open the sphere at the Venetian Resort in the Las Vegas Valley in autumn 2023. The series of shows, named U2 colon U the Eight Tongue Baby Live at Sphere, will be focused on the group's 1991 album Eight Tongue Baby. Mullen, however, will not participate in the concerts due to a planned surgery and period of recuperation 333 marking the first time since 1978 that U2 will perform without him 334 Dutch drummer Graham Van Denberg from the band Krizip will fill in. 333 musical style U2 performing on the Experience Plus Innocence Tour in London in October 2018 Bono's songwriter exhibits a penchant for social, political, and personal subject matter while maintaining the grandiosity
In addition, The Edge has described U2 as a fundamentally live band. 335 U2's early sound was punk influence alternative rock 336 and the group were associated with the post-punk movement. 337 their influences included acts such as Television, Sexy and the band She 338 and Joy Division and their resulting sound was described as containing a sense of exhilaration that resulted from the edges radiant chords and bonus ardent vocals. 339 however, according to Bob Stanley, U2 rejected post-punk's own rejection of pop dazzling Wawrinka, its hunkering down in regional particularities, and its raised finger to populist communication. 340 U2 developed a melodic sound under the early influence of record producer Steve Lilly wait at a time when they were not known for musical proficiency. 222 their songs began as minimalistic and uncomplicated instrumentals heard on Boy and October, before evolving with war to include aspects of rock anthem, funk, and dance rhythms to become more versatile and aggressive. 341 Boy and War were labeled muscular and assertive by Rolling Stone 79 influence in large part by Lilly White's producing the unforgettable fire which began with The Edge playing more keyboards than guitars, as well as follow up the Joshua Tree, had brought an Eno and Daniel Anoise at the production helm. With their influence, both albums achieved a diverse texture. 79 The songs from the Joshua Tree and Rattle and Calm placed more emphasis on Lanois inspired rhythm as they mixed distinct and varied styles of gospel and blues music, which stemmed from the band's burgeoning fascination with America's culture, people and places. In the 1990s, U2 reinvented themselves as they began using synthesizers, distortion, and electronic beats derived from noise music, dance, and hip-hop on Hick Tongue Baby 118 Zora Pop, and Pop. 342 According to Stephen Thomas Erline, U2 was able to sustain their popularity in the 90s by reinventing themselves as a postmodern, self-consciously ironic dance-inflected pop rock act going equally to the experimentalism of late 70s Bowie and 90s electronic dance and techno. 343 They have also been called a pop rock band by biographer Michael Heatley 344 and musicologist Gary Smith. 345 The band's 1990s output has been regarded as an art rock phase in commentaries by Biographer John John Belling 346 Salon journalist Nico Lang 347 and music critic Jim Irogatis 348 as well as in an interview by Bono. 349 Time Magazine's Josh Tyrannell went further in saying that, in the towering period that spanned the Joshua Tree to Zora Pop, you to make stadium size art rock with huge melodies that allowed Bono to throw his arms around the world while bending its ear about social justice. 350 in the 2000s. U2 returned to more stripped-down rock and pop sounds 351 with more conventional rhythms and reduced usage of synthesizers and effects 352 reinventing themselves as a quality pop band according to music journalist Chris Charlesworth. 353 U2's music has been regarded as pop in analyzes by writers David Hawk 350 for Robert Christ Gaunt 355 and Lee All Stokes. 356 in an interview with Stokes for Hot Press Bono explained the band's struggles in the 1980s among highbrow circles who patronized them for being a successful pop group, leading to their embrace of the term pop by the 1990s.356 reviewing their 2000 album All That You Can't Leave Behind. Christ Gore remarked that, since they'd been calling themselves pop for half of their two-decade run, maybe they better sit down and write some catchy songs. So they did. 355 Summing up U2's stylistic evolution since Boy, guitar journalist Owen Bailey said that they have gone on to conquer the world's airways and arenas in a number of different incarnations, ranging from earnest, politically charged new wave flag bearers to white hide art rock musicologists to purveyors of irony laden alt rock and ever onward with the edge remaining at the heart of their sound. 357 vocals Bono performing in Amsterdam in July 2017 Bono is known for his impassioned vocal style, often delivered in the high register through open-throated belting. 106 358 359 360 Bono has been classified as a tenor 361 362 and according to him has a three octave. Vocal range 363 One analysis found it to span from C2 to G5 on studio recordings over the course of his career. 364 He frequently employs wo o vocalizations in his singing. 365 Rock musician Billy Joe Armstrong of Green Day said, 
He's a physical singer, like the leader of a gospel choir, and he gets lost in the melodic moment. He goes to a place outside himself, especially in front of an audience, when he hits those high notes. He added that Bono is not afraid to go beyond what he's capable of. 366 In the early days of U2, Bono unintentionally developed an English vocal accent as a result of him mimicking his musical influences such as Sixy and the Banshee. 367 I still think that I sing like Sixy. From the Banshees on the first two U2 albums. But I found my voice through Joe Ramone at that gig in Dublin. I stood there and heard him singing. He sang a bit like a girl too. It was all going to be okay after all. That was my way in. 368 His vocal style evolved during the band's exploration of Roots music for the Joshua Tree. Spin said that he learned to command the full whisper to shout range of blues mannerisms. 369 Bono attributed this maturation to loosening up, discovering other voices, and employing more restraint in his singing. 374 Where the streets have no name, Bono varied the timbre of his voice extensively and used rubato to vary its timing. 371 While author Susan Fast found with or without you to be the first track on which he extended his vocal range downward in an appreciable way. 372 Bono continued to explore a lower range in the 1990s using what Fast described as breathy and subdued colors for a tongue baby. 373 One technique used on the album is octave doubling, in which his vocals are sung into different octaves, either simultaneously or alternating between verses and choruses. According to Fast, this technique introduces a contrasting lyrical idea and vocal character to deliver it leading to both literal and ironic interpretations of Bono's vocals. 374 on tracks such as Zoo Station and The Flight his vocals were highly processed 361 375 376 giving them a different emotional feel from his previous work. 377 Bono said that lowering his voice helped him find a new vocal vocabulary which he felt was limited to certain words and tones by his tenor voice. 378 His singing on Zor Pot was an even further departure from U2's previous style. Throughout the record, Bono underplayed that his lung power according to John Perrell's 379 and he also used an operatic falsetto he calls the fat lady voice on the tracks Lemon and Numb. 380 381 Guitar The Edge playing his signature guitar the Gibson Explorer. The Edge's style of playing guitar is distinguished by his chiming timbers. 382-383 Echoing notes 37 sparse voicings. 384 and extensive use of effects units. 385 He favors the perfect fifth interval and often plays chords consisting of just two notes, the fifth and the root note while eliminating the third dot 386 387 this style is not explicitly in a minor or major key but implies both creating a musical ambiguity dot 386 37 for these chords he often plays the same notes on multiple strings some of which are left open creating an irish influence drone dot 335 383 388 against this drone he changes other notes to imply a harmony. 389 390 Among the edges, signature techniques are playing arpeggios 29, 389 16th note percussive strumming 391 and harmonics 386, the latter of which he described as so pure and finely focused that they have the incredible ability to pierce through their environment of sound. Just like Lightning Daw 335 his approach to guitar playing is relatively understated and eschews virtuosity in favor of atmospherics, subtlety, minimalism, and clever signal processing Daw 392 rather than emulate common playing styles, the edge is interested in tearing up the rule book and finding new ways to approach the instrument. 37 he cited guitarists such as Tom Verland of television, John Maggio 370 Rory Gallagher and Patti Smith as some of his strongest influences. 393 335 The Edge's guitar sound is frequently modulated with a delay set to 8. Dotted 8 note for rhythmic effect. 383 394 395 After acquiring his first delay pedal, the Electric Harmonics Memory Man 26, he became fascinated with how to use its return echo to fill in notes that he's not playing. Like to guitar players rather than 1.396, the effect unit became a mainstay in his guitar rig and had a significant impact on the band's creative output. 26, the Edge became known for his extensive use of effects units, 
and for his meticulous nature in crafting specific sounds and guitar tones from his equipment choices. 385 397 Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page called him a sonic architect. 396 Wild Meal McCormick described him as an effects meister. 398 Critics have variously referred to the Edge's guitar sounds as evoking the image of fighter planes on Bullet the Blue Sky. 399 Resembling a dentist's drill on Love is Blindness. 376 And resembling an airplane turbine on Mofo. 400 The Edge said that rather than using effects merely to modify his sound, he uses them to spark ideas during his songwriter process. 394 The Edge developed his playing style during his teenage years, partially as a result of him and Mullen trying to accommodate the eccentric bass playing of Clayton by being the timekeepers of the band. 386 In their early days, the Edge's only guitar was his 1976 Gibson Explorer Limited Edition 394-401 which became a signature of the group. 402 However, he found the sound of the Explorer's bass strings unsatisfactory and avoided them in his playing early on, resulting in the treadly sound. He said by focusing on one area of the fretboard he was developing a very stylized way of doing something that someone else would play in a normal way. 403 Other equipment choices contribute to the Edge's unique sound. His 1964 Vox AC30 top boost amplifier housed in a 1970s cabinet is favored for its sparkle tone and is the basis for his sound both in the studio and live. 397 Rather than hold his plectrum with a standard grip, the edge turns it sideways or upside down to use the dimpled edge against the strings, producing a rasping top end to his tone. 37 Rhythm section as rhythm section, Mullen and Clayton often play the same patterns, giving you to S music a driving 400 for 405 pulsating beat 406 that serves as a foundation for the edges guitar work. 405 407 for his drumming, Mullen locks into the edges guitar playing, while Clayton locks his bass playing into Mullen's drumming. 408 author Bill Flanagan said that their playing styles perfectly reflected their personalities. Larry is right on top of the beat. A bit ahead as you'd expect from a man who's so ordered and punctual in his life. Adam plays a little behind the beat, waiting till the last moment to slip in, which fits Adam's casual, don't sweat it personality. 409 Mullen In November 2019 Mullen's drumming style is influenced by his experience in marching bands during his adolescence. 410-411 which helped contribute to the militaristic beats of songs such as Sunday. Bloody Sunday. 55 Flanagan said that he plays with a martial rigidity but uses his cut in a way a properly trained drummer would not. He tends to transition from the snare drum onto tom toms positioned on either side of him, contrasting with how they are traditionally used. 409 Mullen occasionally rides the tom tom the way other drummers would play a cymbal, or rides the hi hat how others would play a snare. 411 He admitted his bass drum technique is not a strength as he mostly played the snare in marching bands and did not learn to properly combine the separate drumming elements together on a full kit. As a result, he uses a floor tom to his left to create the effect of a bass drum. He said, I couldn't do what most people would consider a normal beat for the song, so I chose alternatives. He was heavily influenced by glam rock acts of the 1970s when first learning to play drums. 410 In the early days of U2, Mullen had what Bono called a florid drumming style, before he eventually adopted a philosophy of simplicity and pared down his rhythms. 411 412 His drumming leaves open space. Going to what modern drummer described as his understanding of when to hit and when not to hit. 411 As he matured as a timekeeper, he developed a preternatural sense of rhythm. Edo recounted one occasion when Mullen noticed that his clip track had been set incorrectly by just 6 milliseconds. 413. Under the tutelage of Lanois, Mullen learned more about his musical role as the drummer in filling out the band's sound, while Flood helped Mullen learn to play along with electronic elements such as drum machines and samples. 410. His cut has a tambourine mounted on a cymbal stand. 414, which he Uses as an accent on certain beats for songs such as With or Without You. 411 415 Clayton In October 2018, Clayton's style of bass guitar playing is noted for what instructor Patrick Pfeiffer called harmonic syncopation. Was this technique? Clayton plays a consistent rhythm that stresses the eighth note of each bar, but he anticipates the harmony by shifting the tonality before the guitar chords do. 
This gives the music the feeling of forward motion. 416 In the band's early years, Clayton had no formal musical training. 417 And he generally played simple bass parts in for four time consisting of steady eight notes emphasizing the roots of chords. 418 Over time, he incorporated influences from Motown and reggae into his playing style, and as he became a better timekeeper, his playing became more melodic. 418 Flanagan said that he often plays with the swollen, vibrating bottom sound of a Jamaican dub bassist, covering the most sonic space with the smallest number of notes. 409 Clayton relies on his own instincts. When developing bass lines, deciding whether to follow the chord progressions of the guitar or playing a counter melody, and went to play an octave higher or lower. 408 He cites bassists such as Paul Simonon, Bruce Foxton. Peter Hook, Gene Jacks Bernal 418 and James Jamerson has major influences on him. 419 Describing his role In the rhythm section, Clayton said, Larry's drums have always told me what to play, and then the chords tell me where to go. 418 Lyrics and themes A light-skinned man with brown hair singing into a microphone on a stand, which has a flag draped over it. His shirt and trousers are both gray and feature a design of many overlapping circles. He faces to the right. The line of women stand behind him, each one holding up a sign that says Dotty e stand or just see it. Every sign has an image of a different person below the text. You two performing mothers of the disappeared in Chile in 1998 with the families of Danitos Disaparecidos. The song was written as a tribute to the women whose children were killed or forcibly disappeared at the hands of the Pinochet dictatorship. 420 421 U2S lyrics are known for their social and political themes, and are often embellished with Christian and spiritual image. Read 422 songs such as Sunday Bloody Sunday Silver and Gold and Mothers of the Disappeared were motivated by current events of the time. The first was written about the Troubles in Northern Ireland 423 while the last was a tribute to C.O.M.A.D.R.E.S., the women whose children were killed or forcibly disappeared at the hands of the Salvadoran government during the country's civil war. 424 The song Running to Stand Still from the Joshua Tree was inspired by the heroin addiction that was sweeping through Dublin. The lyric I see seven towers but I only see one way out references the valley mount towers of Dublin's north side and the imagery throughout the song personifies the struggles of addiction. 425 Bono's personal conflicts and turmoil inspired songs like Mofo Tomorrow and Kite. An emotional yearning or pleading frequently appears as a lyrical theme. 426 in tracks such as Yahweh 427 Peace on Earth and Please. Much of you to s songwriter and music is also motivated by contemplations of loss and anguish, coupled with hopefulness and resilience, themes that are central to the Joshua Tree. 79 Some of these lyrical ideas have been amplified by both No and the band's personal experiences during their youth in Ireland, as well as Bono's campaigning and activism later in his life. You too have used tour such as Zoo TV and Pop Mart to caricature social trends, such as media overload and consumerism respectively. 342 While the band and its fans often affirm the political nature of their music, U2S lyrics and music have been criticized as apolitical because of their vagueness and fuzzy imagery and the lack of any specific references to actual people or characters. 428 Influences The band cites Fahu 429 The Clash 430 Television 25 From Jones 431 The Beatles 432 Joy Division 433 Sipsy and the Banshee 434 Elvis Presley 435 Patti Smith 436 And Kraftwerk 437 has influences. In addition, Van Morrison has been cited by both No as an influence 438 and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame mentioned his influence on U2.439 U2 have also worked with or had influential relationships with artists including Johnny Cash, Green Day, Leonard Cohen, Bruce Springsteen, B.B. King, Lou Reed, Bob Dylan and the Chiano Pavarotti. 440 Bono said that David Bowie helped him discover the works of Bertolt Brecht, William Burroughs, Springsteen, and Brian Eno. 441 fellow Irish rock band The Script have also been influenced by U2.440 to activism and philanthropy. Bono with then US President George W. Bush in 2006. Since the early 1980s, the members of U2 as a band and individually have collaborated with other musicians, artists, celebrities, and politicians to address issues concerning poverty, 
disease, and social injustice. In 1984, Bono and Clayton participated in Band Aid to raise money for the 1983 to 85 famine in Ethiopia. This initiative produced the hit charity single Do They Know It's Christmas, which would be the first of several collaborations between U2 and Bob Geldof. In July 1985, U2 performed at Live Aid, the follow-up to Band Aid's efforts. Bono and his wife Arlie, invited by World Vision, visited Ethiopia that year where they witnessed the famine firsthand. Bono later said that this laid the groundwork for his Africa campaigning and some of his songwriter. 203 352 in 1986, U2 participated in the Self Aid Benefit Concert for Unemployment in Ireland and the Conspiracy of Hope Benefit Concert Tour in support of Amnesty International. The same year, Bono and Artley also visited Nicaragua and El Salvador at the invitation of the Sanctuary Movement and saw the effects of the Salvadoran Civil War. These 1986 events greatly influenced the Joshua Tree album, which was being recorded at the time. 101 102 during their Zoo TV tour in 1992, U2 participated in the Stop Sell a Field concert with Greenpeace to protest the nuclear fuel reprocessing plant. 443 events in Sarajevo during the Bosnian War inspired the song Miss Sarajevo, which premiered at a September 1995 Pavarotti and Friends show and which Bono and The Edge performed at War Child. 160 U2 fulfilled the 1993 promise to play in Sarajevo during the Pop Mar Tour in 1997.177 the following year, they performed in Belfast days prior to the vote on the Good Friday Agreement, bringing Northern Irish political leaders David Trimble and John Bume on stage to promote the agreement. 440 for later that year. All proceeds from the release of the Sweetest Thing single went towards supporting the Chernobyl Children's Project. 445 U2 with Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff in 2011 from left to right. Mullen, Bono, Rousseff, Clayton, and The Edge the band dedicated their 2000 song Walk On to Burma's pro democracy leader Hong Sen Suukyi, who had been under house arrest since 1989.446 in late 2003. Bono and The Edge participated in the South Africa HIV slash AIDS Awareness 46664 series of concerts hosted by Nelson Mandela. 447 in 2005, the band played the Live Aid concert in London, which Geldof helped stage on the 20th anniversary of Live Aid to support the Made Poverty History campaign. The band and manager Paul McGuinness were awarded Amnesty International's Ambassador of Conscience Award for their work in promoting human rights. 448 Since 2000, Bono's campaigning has included Julie 2000 with Veldolf, Magama Barley, and others to promote the cancellation of Third World Debt during the Great Jubilee. In January 2002, Bono co founded the multinational NGO Data, with the aim of improving the social, political, and financial state of Africa. He continued his campaigns for debt and HIV AIDS relief into June 2002 by making high profile visits to Africa. 449 Product Red, a for profit licensed brand seeking to raise money for the Global Fund, was co founded by Bono in 2006. 450 The One Campaign, originally the U.S. counterpart of Make Poverty History, was shaped by his efforts and vision. In November 2005, the Edge and producer Bob Yesserin helped introduce Music Rising, an initiative to replace instruments for musicians in the New Orleans area impacted by Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita. 451 in 2006, U2 collaborated with pop punk band Green Day to record a remake of the song The Saints Are Coming by the Skift Benefit Music Rising. 452 A lift version of the song recorded at the Louisiana Superdome was released on the single. At the third Hartford Isle Music Awards in April 2016, U2 were honored with the Innovator Award for their impact on popular culture and commitment to social causes. 453 in April 2020, the group donated 10 million euros to purchase personal protective equipment for Irish healthcare workers working during the COVID-19 pandemic. 454 the band also donated 1.5 million dollars to ease the impact of the pandemic on the music industry including a 200,000 euros donation to the songs from an empty room fundraiser. 455 Bono has received a number of awards for his music and activism, including the Legion of Honor from the French government in 2003 456 times. 
Person of the Year for 2005 along with Bill Gates and Melinda Gates 457 and an honorary British knighthood in 2007. 458 Some new sources have questioned the efficacy of Bono's campaign to relieve debt and provide assistance to Africa. 459 Other projects and collaborations the members of U2 have undertaken side projects, sometimes in collaboration with some of their bandmates. In 1985, Bono recorded the song In a Lifetime with the Irish band Clannod. The Edge recorded a solo soundtrack album for the film Captive, which was released in 1986-460 and included a vocal performance by Sinead O'Connor on the song Heroin that predates her own debut album by a year. For Robbie Robertson's 1987 self-titled solo album, U2 performed on the song Sweet Fire of Long and Testimony. 107 Both No and The Edge wrote the song She a Mystery to Me for Roy Orbison, which was featured on his 1989 album Mystery Girl. 461 In 1990, Bo No and The Edge provided the original score to the Royal Shakespeare Company London's stage adaptation of A Clockwork Orange. One track. Alex descends into hell for a bottle of milk flash Korova one was on the B-side to the fly single. 462-463 that same year, Mullen produced and played drums on Put Them Under Pressure a song for the Irish national football team for the 1990 FIFA World Cup, the song topped the Irish charts for 13 weeks. 464 for the 1995 James Bond film Goldenite. Bono and The Edge wrote the title song Goldeneye which was performed by Tina Turner. 465 Clayton and Mullen reword the theme from Mission, Impossible for the franchise's 1996 film. 466 Bono and The Edge ventured into a theater again. By writing the music and lyrics for the Broadway musical Spider-Man, Turn Off the Dark 467 which opened in June 2011. 468 Bono and The Edge collaborated with Dutch DJ Martin Garrix on the 2021 track We Are The People which served as the official song of the UEFA 2020 Euros Tournament. 469 In addition to collaborating with fellow musicians, you too have worked with several authors. American author William S. Burroughs had a guest appearance in U2 X video for Last Night on Earth shortly before he died. 470 video footage of him reading his poem Thanksgiving Prayer was used during a Zoo TV tour television special. 471 Other collaborators include Alan Ginsberg, 472, and Salman Rushdie. Lyrics from Rushdie's 1999 book The Ground Beneath Her Feet were adapted by U2 into the song The Ground Beneath Her Feet 473 which was one of three tracks the group contributed to the Million Dollar Hotel movie soundtrack in 2000. In April 2017, U2 were featured on a Kendrick Lamar song, XXX from his album Damn. 474 Legacy Main Article List of awards and nominations received by U2 The Edge and Bono clothed in leather jackets as the edge holds a guitar vertically. A large dangling light bulb hangs between them. Rolling Stone ranked the edge and Bono among the greatest guitarists and singers, respectively. You two have sold an estimated 150170 million records worldwide, placing them among the best-selling music artists in history. One the group's fifth studio album, The Joshua Tree, is one of the best-selling albums in the U.S. 10 million copies shipped and worldwide 25 million copies sold. 475 476 with 52 million certified units. By the RIAA, U2 rank as the 24th highest-selling music artist in the US. 477 U2 have eight albums that have reached number one in the U.S., the third most of any group. They were the first group to attain number one albums in the U.S. in the 1980s. 1990s, 2000s, and 2010s. 478 in the UK, the group have had seven number one singles, tied for the 17th most of any artist, and 11 number one albums, tied for the seventh most of any artist. 479 The band's 1467 weeks spent on the UK music charts ranks 17th all time. 45 in their native Ireland. U2 hold the record for most number one singles with 21 480 and they have 10 number one albums. 481 in the 1980s. U2 dominated the alternative rock scene according to cultural critic Kevin J. H. Detmar. 482 similarly, in the next decade, 
They were one of the most famous alternative rock bands worldwide and among the highest selling rock bands. 483 record sales declined in the 2000s and the music industry entered an age of often illegal digital downloading. But according to author Matt Snow, U2 prospered more than younger acts because of a loyal following that held an attachment to the album format. Snow said, Children of the album era as they were. U2 would never stop regarding the album as the core statement of their creativity despite progressively decreasing sales, while he noted that live shows consequently became the group's greatest source of revenue. 484 According to Billboard Box Court, the band grossed $1.67 billion in ticket sales from 1990 to 2016, second only to the Rolling Stones. 485 U2 were the only group in the top 25 cheering acts from 2000 to 2009 to sell out every show they played. 486 According to Polestar, the band grossed $1.038 billion and sold 9,300,500 tickets from 255 shows played between 2010 and November 2019. Turning the publication's title of Turing Artist of the 2010s Decade, U2 were the only artist to surpass $1 billion grossed during that span. 487 Forbes has named U2 the world's annual highest earning music artist a record five times. 488 The Sunday Times 2020 Irish Rich List estimated the group's collective wealth at 670 million euros. U2 are regarded as one of the greatest pop rock acts of all time. 490 Rolling Stone placed U2 at number 22 on its list of the 100 greatest artists of all time to while ranking Bono the 32nd greatest singer 366 The Edge the 38th greatest guitarist 491 band. Mullen the 96th greatest drummer. 492 The magazine placed both No and The Edge at number 35 on its list of the 100 greatest songwriters of all time. 493 In 2004, Q ranked U2 as the fourth biggest band in a list compiled based on album sales, time spent on the UK charts, and largest audience for a headlining show. 494 VH1 placed U2 at number 19 on its 2010 list of the 100 greatest artists of all time. 495 in 2010, eight of U2's songs appeared on Rolling Stone's updated list of the 500 greatest songs of all time with one ranking the highest at number. 36.496 Five of the group's 12 studio albums were ranked on the magazine's 2012 list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. The Joshua Tree placed the highest at number 27.114 reflecting on the band's popularity and worldwide impact. Jeff Pollock for the Huffington Post said, Like the Who before them. U2 wrote songs about things that were important and resonated with their audience. 497 Houston Press journalist John Seaborn Gray attributed U2 X pioneering impact on pop rock music largely to the Edge's unique guitar style. 498 U2 were recipients of Kennedy Center Honors in 2022. U2 received their first Grammy Award in 1988 for the Joshua Tree and they have won 22 in total out of 46 nominations 113 more than any other group. 499 These include Best Rock Performance by a Duo or Group, Album of the Year, Record of the Year, Song of the Year, and Best Rock Album. In the UK, U2 have received 7 Brit Awards out of 20 nominations from the British Phonographic Industry, including 5 wins for Best International Group. They were the first international group to win the Brit Award for Outstanding Contribution to Music. 500 in Ireland. U2 have won 14 Meteor Awards since the awards began in 2001. Other awards won by the band and their members include 1 American Music Award, 6 MTV Video Music Awards, 11 Q Awards, 2 Juno Awards, 5 Emmy Awards, and the Golden Globe Awards. The band were inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in March 2005. 235 in 2006. All four members of the band received SCAP awards for writing the songs I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For and Vertigo. 501 in 2022. The group received Kennedy Center honors for their contributions in the Performing Arts 502 making them only the fifth musical group to be so honored. 503 members U2 in November 2019 from left to right the edge. Both No, Clayton, Mullen current members both No Paul Hewson lead vocals, rhythm guitar, harmonica 1976 present to the edge David Evans lead guitar, keyboards, backing, vocals 1976 present Adam Clayton, 
bass guitar 1976 present Larry Mullen Jr. Drums Percussion 1976 present Current Turing Musicians Terry Lawless Keyboards 2001 present 504 Ram Van Denberg Drums Percussion 2023 333 Former Members Dick Evans Guitar 1976-1978 Ivan McCormick Guitar 1976 Discography Main Articles YouTube Discography and List of Songs Recorded Boy 1980 October 1981 War 1983 The Unforgettable Fire 1984 The Joshua Tree 1987 Rattle and Hum 1988 Take Tongue Baby 1991 Zorpa 1993 Pop 1997 All That You Can't Leave Behind 2000 How to Dismantle An Atomic Bomb 2004 No Line on the Horizon 2009 Songs of Innocence 2014 Songs of Experience 2017 Songs of Surrender 2023 Live Performances The Edge During the Band's Zoo TV Tour In November 1993 Concert Tour Sued 3 Tour 1979 to 1980 11 O'Clock Tick Tock Tour 1980 Boy Tour 1980 to 1981 October Tour 1981 to 1982 War Tour 1982 to 1983 The Unforgettable Fire Tour 1984 to 1985 The Joshua Tree Tour 1987 Love Town Tour 1989 to 1990 Zoo TV Tour 1992 to 1993 Pop Mart Tour 1997 to 1998 Elevation Tour 2001 Vertigo Tour 2005 to 2006 U360 Degrees Tour 2009 to 2011 Innocence Plus Experience Tour 2015 The Joshua Tree Tour 2017 2017 Experience Plus Innocence Tour 2018 The Joshua Tree Tour 2019 2019 Concert residencies you to colon UVA tongue baby life. That fear 2023.